Greetings, little blue men, and welcome to Codex Compliant. This holiday season, we've got an episode that's got nothing to do with Christmas or the New Year. Not even a little tenuous joke to link them. It, it's just the video we happen to be doing in December. Sorry. The Ultramarines are the greatest of all Space Marine chapters. From the dawn of the Imperium, they have served the Emperor with loyalty and a ferocity no others can match. Their Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, wrote the Codex Astartes, and the chapter has exemplified its teachings ever since. Today, we're looking at the very first vanilla Marine Codex, Codex Ultramarines from 1995. Hailing from Warhammer 40,000's second edition, it was written by Rick Priestley and Jervis Johnson with Alan Merritt, and its cover art is once again by David Gallagher. Interestingly, it wasn't actually the first Marine Codex, despite representing their default incarnation in the edition where Codexes first appeared. That honour would go to Codex Space Wolves. Also, I guess it's pretty good timing, seeing as during the making of this video, Space Marine 2 was announced, and the main character of Space Marine is Captain Titus, who is an Ultramarine. Yeah, that's a decade-old game I don't think any of us thought we'd ever get a sequel for. Anyway, as we might have mentioned once or twice, we find the modern Marine codices to be maybe a smidge on the bloated side, with an already large roster of first-born Marine units becoming increasingly engorged by each new wave of Primaris. I mean, we generally like the new models, but between Blade Guard, Aggressors, Reavers, Inceptors, Infiltrators, Incursors, Intercessors, Assault Intercessors, and Heavy Intercessors, to name a few, it's all gotten a little bit much. But 2nd Edition's Codex Ultramarines was at the exact opposite end of the spectrum. There's very little beyond the basics here, and it's quite refreshing because of it. Also, we recently made some videos about playing 2nd Edition, and we used it there, so it felt like a fitting time to talk about it. So, first off, yes, despite this representing all Codex-compliant chapters game-wise, it's called Codex Ultramarines, and the Ultras are the only chapter to get any major attention. We mention this partially since, well, it's just a thing you can see with your eyeballs, there's really no avoiding it, but also because we've seen people over the years talk as if Ultramarines being presented as the default Marine chapter was something that originated in 5th edition, and that's just not true. It's a thing that's been around for most, not all, most, of 40k's history to a greater or lesser extent. And, love them or hate them, given the Ultramarines' place in the background as both the chapter to whom so many contract their lineage, and whose Primarch literally wrote the book on how to do an Astartes good, it makes a lot of sense for them to have such a prominent position. Like other codices and army books of this era, the early part of the book has a large chunk of backstory before it is sullied by the sordid subject of rules. In there, it goes over the creation of the Space Marines during the early days of the Imperium, a quick summation of the Horus Heresy, and the subsequent breaking apart of the Loyalist Space Marine Legions into the smaller chapters of the modern game. It's still mostly accurate, with just little elements here and there showing it belongs to an older iteration of the lore. Like how, even though Thunder Warriors are mentioned, their name isn't used and they are described as being less powerful than Marines, something that has been inverted in the current fluff. The next section details the history of the Ultramarine chapter itself. This involves covering the life of their Primarch, Bobbert Gilliman, following his rise to ruling the world of Macrag, taking control of the Ultramarines when the Emperor showed up, and their actions during the Heresy. Like before, it's still broadly accurate to modern lore, but the one big thing that's different is that, in here, the heresy is mostly something that just passed the Ultras by, as they were kind of busy elsewhere at the time. So there's no mention of the events of Kalth, or any other things created later, to give the Ultras something to do in the Horus Heresy series. Although it would have been funny if they kept this incarnation for the heresy novels, you know, just occasionally cutting to Big Bobby G, just twiddling his thumbs, just hanging out. Hanging out with his family. <laughs> Afterwards, it talks about the second founding in the Empire of Ultramar, the area around Macrag that the Ultramarines control. In there, we do finally get a mention of Kalth, although it's just brought up as an important place in Ultramar. That's lack of atmosphere is seemingly natural rather than it being stripped of one during the Battle of Kalth. You know, since they hadn't actually written about that yet. Although it is always fun to see Gilliman's return prophesize in old books, literally decades before he did actually come back. I remember reading that in older editions and thinking it'd be cool if it happened, but that they'd never actually do it. Well, they sure showed me. But let us move on from the narrative and onto the more rules side of things. 
Like we've mentioned in other videos, but we don't know if you've seen those, so we'll repeat it anyway, armies from 2nd edition did not use the force organisational charts seen in later editions. Instead, your units were broken down into different groups. In this codex, those groups were characters, squads and support, although other codices can vary a little. You could take a certain percentage of each of these groups in any army you made, and here it was maximum 50% characters, minimum 25% squads, and maximum 50% support. On the characters front, you could choose from Terminator captains and regular captains, which are basically the same except for one being a bit chunkier. Strictly speaking, you did need to take one of these to be your army commander, unless you were taking a special character, but you could fill out the rest of your allowance of characters with company standards, chaplains, librarians, apothecaries, tech marines, and veteran sergeants. And due to the way Wargear worked, it was absolutely possible to make things like a tech marine in Terminator armour, which is always fun. On the squads front, there's Terminators, Veterans, Assault Squads, Tactical Squads, Devastator Squads, Scout Squads, and Bike Squadrons, meaning it was super easy to do themed armies based around something like, say, bikes or Terminators, since you could fill up your basic requirements using them and then just have an appropriately geared captain. Also, many of the squads were required to be in squads of 10, but they could be combat squatted into two groups of five. So, for example, if you had a Devastator squad, you could split the heavy weapons into both combat squads, or have them all in one and have a second five-man squad effectively be a small extra tactical squad running around. However, an article that gave you rules to just make five-man squads on their own was included in White Dwarf 209, as it was recognised that having to take big ten-man squads by default was a little inflexible. For similar reasons, that article also suggested allowing any character to be an army commander, rather than just a captain. For support choices, there were dreadnoughts. Whirlwinds, land raiders, predators, land speeders, attack bikes, rhinos and razorbacks, along with tarantulas and rapier laser destroyers, and any allies you wish to take from other marine lists. The Imperial Guard, Imperial Agents, Squats or Eldar. Although in the latter case, you couldn't have an avatar in your army. I suppose listing it all out like that does make the amount of choice seem a little less compact and basic than we suggested originally, especially if you compare them to a list like, say, the 3rd edition Necron one. But remember that in the current codex there are five, arguably six, kinds of dreadnought rather than just one, and there are five different flavours of marines referred to as veterans by name. Comparatively speaking, this was bare bones. As for army-wide special rules, there's a couple. Like always, Marines had an easier time when failing the second ed version of a leadership test, and Marines are able to fire their bolt weapons, excluding heavy bolters, twice if they didn't move. Something notable, as weapons in second edition generally only got one dice roll to hit, regardless of how many shots they were actually supposed to be firing in universe. Unlike some second ed codices, this one thankfully isn't full of complicated weapons that took full pages to explain how they worked, apart from the Whirlwind's multi launcher, but even then, it's not too bad. Although it, it can just explode if it misfires, so I mean, I don't know, watch out, I guess. I'd make a joke about, ooh, who's that warning for? It's not like anyone's playing 2nd Edition anymore, but we literally did just play a game of 2nd Edition, so, um, yeah. Another neat thing is that placing weapons on the more sturdy frame of a Dreadnought allowed them to do some interesting tricks. For example, sustained fire weapons like assault cannons rolled a unique dice that could cause jams, but due to the more robust systems on these chunky lads, they could just ignore the first jam result, and the Dreadnought version of a multi-melter was able to adjust the focus of its energy beam, which meant that it could choose to fire with the same effect as a heavy flamer if you were so inclined. On the special characters front, you have Chief Librarian Tigurius and his mighty mighty rod, Chapter Daddy Marnius Kalgar, bearer of the Gauntlets of Ultramar, a pair of mighty fists with built-in guns that gave him the ability to be less likely to be overwhelmed by enemies in 2nd edition's kinda weird melee rules. Then there was Chaplain Cassius, who could negate the Tyranid Sphere effect on any squad he led. Ancient Helveticus, a standard bearer with a name that makes me feel like we'd owe fontshop.com money if we used him. And yes, we made a similar joke about his name when he last showed up in a video, and we'll do it again should he reappear. And Captain Invictus, the leader of the Ultramarine's first company who wields a fancy plasma blaster gun. 
Now, all of those characters were specifically for the Ultramarines, but there was one final non-Ultramarine entry to the special characters, which was actually a squad. The Legion of the Damned. Yeah, you could take a single squad of 10 damned legionnaires along for the ride, and they were pretty much just better tactical marines who instilled fear in their opponents, on account of all the skulls and flames and stuff we assume. Although I'd imagine that living in the 40k universe, you'd get pretty numb to seeing skulls considering your toaster is probably made of one. The colour section in this one is pretty beefy, containing not just lovely pictures of well-painted retro models in their older yellow-rimmed red gun case glory, but also having a lot of detail on the iconography used by chapters that are Codex compliant. Of particular note is a double-page spread covering the various honour badges, with some nice artwork demonstrating them in all of their mid-90s skulls but with angry eyes glory. This section contains a lot of interesting nuggets that you might not know, like that the winged skull motif you see on things like marine chest plates is called the Imperialis, or those bolter rounds with skulls on them that you sometimes see marines with are the Marksman's Honour, a thing given to marines who are well good at shooting so that when someone needs something shot, they know who to ask. It also has a small section on army badges, which are the symbols worn by Imperial forces when on a particular campaign, and so these symbols can be seen worn both by Marines and other Imperial forces. It's not like they're not mentioned in the current Codex or anything, but it's just nice to see a little more detail on them, like how if a squad, regiment, or even individual performed exceptionally on a campaign, they will sometimes incorporate the army badge from that campaign into their own heraldry, which is the kind of thing that can provide you with a nice excuse for creating unique looking squads, even within an army that's supposed to look pretty uniform. Actually, there's a surprising amount of fluff in this section, getting into the minutiae of chapter organisation, right down to some really specific iconography stuff like the symbols used to denote certain kinds of tanks. Why yes, I am going to sneak some of those symbols onto the next tank I paint, thanks for asking. As for the marines of the non-ultra variety, there's a page on the Legion of the Damned from before they had specific models, and so relied on some pretty spectacular paint jobs in order to convey the theme, as well as a page of the Imperial Fists. The other handful of chapters mentioned in this section had to make do with some very brief descriptions alongside an example model. The most notable one here is an early Black Templar, lacking pretty much everything we think of as representing a Black Templar beyond being black and the Maltese cross icon. This section is mostly used to demonstrate how some chapters will still have variations in their markings, even if they follow the Codex Astartes, like the aforementioned Black Templars representing company via the colour of their decidedly uneagled chest eagle, the Storm Lords doing it by the colour of their helmets, or the Doom Eagles doing it with a numbered knee pad. So yeah, that's Codex Ultramarines. Like all 2nd edition codices, this book would be replaced in 3rd edition due to radical changes in the game, first replaced by the list in the main rulebook in 1998, and then shortly afterwards by Codex Space Marines, which dropped the Ultramarine specific name for a more generic branding with a cover featuring the Crimson Fists, presumably as a nod to the cover of Rogue Trader. However, all subsequent Vanilla Marine Codexes would go back to having Ultras on the cover, and they'd be prominently discussed within. As such, we never really got a fully-fledged Codex Ultramarines again, as they were all over the main codices anyway, so it would have been a bit redundant. However, in 2019, they did get their own supplement for use with 8th edition's Second Marine Codex. But to get back to this colourful book from the mid-90s, it's a neat little thing for information on Marine's past and an interesting comparison to its modern iterations. A treasure trove of old iconography guides should you wish to incorporate a slightly different take on the Codex colour schemes on your modern Marines, and a reminder that Marine codices weren't always quite so... large. So, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a very Happy New Year to you all. We hope Grandfather Gilliman brought you every little gift your hearts desired. Although knowing him, he probably brought you something boring, like a tactical advantage over your enemies. Hey there! Thank you very much for watching this video, and for watching another full year of Codex Compliant. We just managed to sneak this one in before January. If you enjoyed it, please consider giving us a like or leaving a comment. If you're not already, maybe a cheeky subscribe if you're really feeling saucy. And if you'd like to support the channel, we have a merch store where you can get t-shirts and mugs, and a Patreon where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits here, as well as early access to most of our videos. Anyway, we hope 2021 wasn't too horrible for you, and we'll see you next year.